text this morning, and then for a short while we're going to jump over to chapter 3. Now when I was here a week and a half ago on Wednesday, we looked at Revelation chapter 3, the church at Sardis, which is not the most positive lesson that I've ever preached. All right, the Lord begins that text by saying, you have a name or you have a reputation that you're alive, but you are dead. So I said, well, I'm going to come in here Sunday morning Bible class and let's do a positive lesson looking at a church and, and let's say some positive things about the Lord's church. So I want you to notice eight things in the text in 1 Thessalonians. Seven of those things are going to be in chapter 1 and one of those things is going to be in chapter 3. All right, so let me just hit the heading just, just very quickly here. Some commendation that Paul offers to the church at Thessalonica. Number one, Paul begins by remembering, if you notice in verse 3, remembering without ceasing, I'm using New King James, that's been my preaching Bible for years and years, so New King James, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope, in our Lord Jesus Christ and the sight of our God and Father. There's a three-point sermon right there in verse 3. The three, th three of the things that this congregation was known for in verse 3. If you jump down to verses uh, 5 through 6, you have the manner in which they receive the word. Notice in verses 5 through, uh, five through 6, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. And in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake, and you became followers of us and the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, in order to get that whole context, you have to jump down a little bit later to chapter 2. We'll do that in just a moment. The next commendation you have in the, in the text here is in verse 6. They became followers of us. Paul says, you became followers of us, speaking of himself and his companions. So if you go back to Acts chapter 17, Silas was there. And then you go back to Acts chapter 17, Timothy was there as well. Because after they get to Athens, Paul sends Timothy to them because he's concerned about their growth. All right, And you see that in chapter 3 a little bit later. So they became followers or imitators of Paul and his companions. They became imitators of the Lord. And then they also become imitators of the churches in Judea that you read a little bit later in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 14. So the next heading there, in chapter 1 and verse 6, they endured persecution because of their faith. Notice that phrase in verse 6, having received the word with much affliction. And you read again of that background in Acts chapter 17. It was a very, I mean, we're talking weeks, a very short time after the gospel came to them. Uh, Paul, was, uh, Paul was there in uh, the city of Thessalonica just a few weeks before the Jews sniffed out that, you know, that he was there. Hey, we need to run this guy off. And you notice in the book of Acts, over and over and over again, Paul, where's the first place he goes to preach? The synagogue. It's been given to you first, to the Jews first. So he'd go to the synagogue and preach. There'd be some converted, some, some of the Greeks who had proselytized over to Judaism. They were converted in Acts chapter 17, but then, you know, uh, things, things start to stir up. Well, this guy's preaching Jesus. This guy's preaching he's the Messiah. And, of course, we know the Jews didn't like that, and they put Jesus to death because they, they couldn't accept his ministry. All right, so they endured persecution. Number next here in the outline, they became examples to area churches. And specifically in two areas he mentions there in verse 7, in Macedonia and Achaia. All right, so Acts chapter 17, the, the beginning of the church at Thessalonica, is bookended by these two regions. You and I would call them states in our in, in our. Uh, vernacular today all right you know we would say something like the church here at Dexter you became examples to all the churches in Arkansas and Illinois all right so we're talking about a particular radius here the churches in Macedonia mentioned in Acts 16 are Philippi and Berea 
the church in Achaia is going to be the church of Corinth that you're going to read later in Acts chapter 18. Look at verse 8. For why? Why were they examples? What specifically does Paul have in mind when he says you became examples? Look at verse 8. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. So watch this. They were what? An evangelistic church. They were evangelistic. The word of the Lord, it, the, the word of the Lord launched from them, or it sounded forth from them. And then you get down to verse uh, 9 in chapter 1. What's another commendation here? For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So the next commendation in, the next commendation in chapter 1 is what? They turned to idols. Well, what are we talking about? They forsook that idolatrous past and they became followers of God. All right? Now, the reason I'm doing this at the very beginning is because we're not going to have time. We're just not to go back through and look at all these points specifically. I'll pick out a few things. Well, when you get to chapter 3, what's interesting about chapter 3 is that Paul was concerned about their spiritual growth. He was concerned about their spiritual growth. Now imagine this. You're, you're at a congregation. You're there, uh, you're, you're there a few weeks. You're able to establish a congregation of the Lord's people there in the city of Thessalonica. The Jews ran Paul out of town. All right? 1 Thessalonians was written somewhere around six months to a year after Paul left the city. And, and I want you to think about that. Six months later, he's writing them this letter and he's concerned about their spiritual growth. He was so concerned about their, their growth and their well-being that he says in chapter 3, I've got to send Timothy to you. Now, we don't know exactly when that was. I would imagine maybe just a few months after they left. He says, boy, I'm just concerned about this church. I'm concerned about their growth. I'm concerned about how they're doing. The reason is because they were persecuted very early on. And so Paul says, let me send Timothy back to you, and he's going to check up on you. He's going to encourage you. He's going to edify. And then when Timothy goes and he comes back to Paul, you read down through chapter 3 the news that he brings, some of the things uh, that are specifically mentioned there in the text in chapter 3. All right, so let's go back to the beginning of the page here. What's interesting about these two epistles is these two epistles, First and Second Thessalonians, were written very close together. Now you're going to notice a commendation in chapter 1 of First Thessalonians about verses 2, 3, and 4 an introductory commendation. And then when you get to 2 Thessalonians, you're going to notice a parallel here in verses 3 and 4. So let me read that. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 and 4. Just have your Bibles open. We're going to spend most of our time on these few pages here. Paul says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting. So now this is the second letter, the second time he's written to them. Listen to this. Because your faith grows exceedingly... Now, the first time he wrote them, he, com uh, he, he commended their work of faith. The second time he writes them, he says, your faith grows exceedingly. The first time he wrote them, he commended their labor of love. And so you stay in the text in the second epistle in verse 3, your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you abounds toward each other. The first time he wrote them, he commended their faith, love, and their patience of hope. And so look at 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 4. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So you notice in the first epistle, 
He says, your faith, your love, and your patience. In the second epistle, he says, your faith, your love, and your patience. So, he's, he's able, basically, to repeat what he said the first time. And he's able to commend them in the first epistle and in the second epistle as well. In the first epistle, he commends their patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5. This is a parallel verse here. He says, Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Now again, why is that idea of patience important in the text here? How did they receive the word? Paul tells them, you receive the word with what? With much affliction. Let's just turn back to Acts chapter 17. Let's lay a little bit of groundwork here. In Acts chapter 17. Verse 1, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. What do we call that message in verse 3? Christ had to suffer, he died, he was buried, he rose again. What do we call that? The what? Okay, the gospel, right? The message of the gospel. So his message was not unique to the city of Thessalonica. That was something that, again, you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 that Paul His message was preaching Christ. His message was preaching Christ crucified. So you and I would call that the gospel. Reference, uh, again, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4 there. All right, so he goes in and he preaches the gospel to them. Look at verse 4, Acts 17. And some of them were persuaded, again, some of the Jews is what that's referring to. Some of the Jews were persuaded A great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Well, what about the other Jews in verse 5? What about the Jews who didn't approve of the gospel? What about the Jews who didn't approve of the message of Christ? Okay, it was not pretty, was it? It was not pretty. They went and formed a mob. They stirred up people in the marketplace. They, they, you know, we, we would call them kind of rough and tough guys. They, 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 these guys were uh, you know, a little rough, a little uncut. And uh, they said, hey, we, we need to go to the marketplace, and we need to, get a, uh, we need to get a mob together, and we need to go shut this guy Paul down. So that's what they did. So you have the Jews there in verse 5. Some were not persuaded. They become envious. They took some of the evil men from the marketplace, gathered a mob. They attacked um, the house of Jason. They set the city in uproar. They, uh, again, the, uh, the ruler of the synagogue there wanted to bring him out to the people. They ended up, um, it jumped down to verse 9, they ended up taking security from Jason and the rest. They, hey, we'll send all these guys home. Just, uh, you know, give us a little, uh, give us a little something under the, under the dark of night. So that's what they did, all right? And then you, beginning in verse 10, Paul went on to Berea. So literally, we're talking about Acts chapter 17. When Paul establishes the church there in Acts chapter 17, he was only there a few weeks before he got ran out of town. Then you stay in the text in Acts 17, the Jews, well, he went on to Berea. The Jews follow him to Berea as well. And Boy, they just made his ministry difficult, didn't they? They made his ministry difficult. You go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul says you receive the word with power and the Holy Spirit. In what way is the word demonstrated with power? Okay, through the Holy Spirit. Now when we're talking about the Holy Spirit in that context, What particular aspect of the Holy Spirit are we talking about? Okay, the miraculous measure. 
Mark chapter 16 and verse 20 comes to mind because that text tells us that in order to confirm the word, what does it take? Thanks, sir. You and I have the prophetic word confirmed today. We have Genesis to Revelation, right? But in order to confirm the word in the first century, what had to go hand in hand with that spoken word? Signs and wonders, right? You read that in Mark 16, verse 20. You read that in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. That those signs would go hand in hand with a spoken word. But you and I have the prophetic word confirmed. That's what we have today. So when Paul says we came and we, we preach to you with much power of the Holy Spirit, the next phrase there in verse 5, and in much assurance, and you know what kind of men we were among you for your sakes. Turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 now. And let's look at verse 14. How are men made Christians today? Okay, by obeying the gospel. Is that the same way that men were made Christians in the first century? Were people made Christians in the first century by a miraculous vision? No. Were people made Christians in the first century by the Lord speaking to them directly? They weren't. Many in our religious world today, they want to go to Acts chapter 9 and they want to look at Saul of Tarsus, converted on the road to Damascus. Well, he wasn't converted on the road. He wasn't converted until after he got to the city of Damascus. You remember in Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, the Lord, the Lord tells him, go into the city and what? It will be told you what you must do. Paul would, or Peter rather, would say in Acts chapter 11, speaking about Cornelius and his household, uh, verse 14, I believe it is, that, uh, you know, I, I, would speak, um, I would speak words to you. There, there would have to be something preached. There would have to be something shared. With them, And so you see that idea here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 14. How are men called today? Well, Paul says here, which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said of himself, if I be lifted up from the earth, what? I will draw all men unto me. Now that phrase, lifted up from the earth, is a euphemism for the crucifixion. If I be crucified, I'm going to draw all men unto, unto me. Now Paul, when he says, I preach Christ and Him, what? Crucified, that's the way that God calls or the way that God draws today is through the preaching of the teaching of the gospel. Not through an angel, not through a miraculous vision, not through uh, a, a direct operation of the Holy Spirit, but we're talking about through the preaching and through the teaching of God's Word. That's not changed since the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles in Acts chapter 2. That's the same way that the Lord draws people today is through the preaching of the gospel. All right, now let's turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 now. now we're, I'm going back and forth. I just want to pick up some of these parallels between the two epistles. I lo this, is, this is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. I love this verse in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. Sometimes when we read Acts 17, 11, talking about the Bereans, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Sometimes the church at Thessalonica gets a bad rap, but the text there in Acts 17 and verse 11 is not talking about the Christians in Thessalonica. It's talking about the Jews that caused a problem. 
Now what about those in Thessalonica that heard the word and believed the message of Paul and Silas and Timothy? Watch this in chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. Paul says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing. Listen to this. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Let me talk about a couple of different extremes here. One extreme is to claim to be sincere, to claim to be honest with God, to claim to be in good conscience with God, but when you're shown the truth of what the Bible says, when you're shown what, a, what, what you must do in order to obey the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, Romans chapter 6, die to the old man of sin, be buried in water, raised to walk in newness of life. Somebody will say, well, I don't believe that. That's not what I did. Okay, so that's one extreme. I'm going to be sincere. I'm going to be honest with God. I'm going to be honest with myself. But when, we, but, but when we can come to book, chapter, and verse, and when we can look at ten specific examples in the book of Acts, that teach us that baptism is necessary for salvation, and somebody says, I just don't want to believe that. Say, well, how were you saved? How did you become a Christian? Well, I accepted Jesus. I said the sinner's prayer, and I accepted Jesus into my heart. Please show me where that's at. Give me one example in Scripture of somebody saying the sinner's prayer and accepting Jesus into their heart to be saved. So one extreme is to say, I'm sincere, I'm honest, and not accept the word of God. The other extreme is to accept the word of men. I'm going to substitute what the Bible says for what the Pope says. Or I'm going to substitute what the Bible says for what my particular denominational uh, council or convention says. Now I want you to notice these two commendations in 1 Thessalonians 2 and in verse 13. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men. Is it true or false that some people in our religious world today, they more readily accept what a man says than what God's word says? Is that true or false? It's true, isn't it? There are some who are going to more readily accept what a man says, what their preacher, what their pastor says, what their convention says, what their council says, what, what the leader, the, the, the board of directors, or however the particular denominations organized. And then there are some that when you come to a, a, a book, chapter, and verse, they're going to say something like, well, that's just your opinion. That's not what I believe because that's, that's just your opinion. I say, no, it's not my opinion. Go, look, look at Mark 16, 16. That's not my opinion. That's something that Jesus commanded in the Great Commission. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. That's not my opinion. So, the, the, and again, you know this as the restoration plea. The plea of the restoration movement was, and the plea that many preachers in churches of Christ have today, that many elderships in churches of Christ have today, is just this simple question. Can we get back to the Bible and just teach the Bible? Let's just do that. Because if we can teach the Bible, if we can become Christians like they did in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, why would we not do that? If we can become a Christian like Saul of Tarsus did when he recounts his conversion in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16... When Ananias tells him, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Why can't we just do that? 
You heard me say several, uh, a week and a half ago when I was here, I don't have to wait for a church creed. I don't have to wait for a council decision. I don't have to wait for a convention decision. I don't have to wait for the Pope to make a statement to determine what I can preach any given Sunday morning because all I have to do is open God's Word and preach God's Word. That's all we have to do. So you notice the commendation there, the manner in which they received the Word. You welcomed it not as the Word of men, but it is in truth the Word of God which also effectively works and you who believe. This just brings out another question in verse 13. If it's the word of God which works effectively in those who believe, what would that say about a creed or a council decision or the decision of any man? Does it work the same way as the word of God would work? It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Paul says they became followers of us. And you can look at a number of different examples there. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. They became imitators of the churches in Judea. 1 Thessalonians 2.14, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. And he goes on talking about killing Jesus. So the persecution in Acts chapter 17 is unique when it comes to the church at Thessalonica because they were persecuted not only by the Jews, but they were also persecuted by their own countrymen. Paul indicates that uh, in the text here. And, and again, what we read just a moment ago in Acts chapter 17 indicates that as well. So how they received the word, they received it with much affliction. Let me ask you this. Is there any church in the book of Acts that received the word of God without affliction? Can you think of one? Is there any church in the book of Acts that received the word of God without affliction? And yet, what was the state of the church in the book of Acts? Somebody said it over here. Growing. They always grew. See, we have, it, we have it backwards in our society, in our culture today. We think that if we get a little bit of persecution, if we get a little bit of heat from the media, if we get a little bit of heat on social media, if somebody says something bad about us, that we just need to sit down and shut up. Like they told blind Bartimaeus to do in Mark chapter 10. Just sit down and shut up. What did Bartimaeus do? <laughs> Scripture says he cried out all the more. Church, that's what you and I need to do today. You want to know the reason why the church is declining today? You want to know the reason why we're losing our young people in the church today? It's because we've compromised on the truth. That's why. It's because we've stopped being evangelistic. We're persecuted a little bit by, by society today, and we're like, okay, we'll go over here and take a seat. In the book of Acts, what happened when they were persecuted? I think about Acts chapter 5. They prayed for boldness, didn't they? The apostles prayed for boldness. They, they, they were able to rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer. Saul, before he, became, before he became a Christian, turn back to Acts chapter 8 a minute. You see this idea in Acts chapter 8. Let's read the first four verses here. Of course, you know Paul, before he became a Christian, he persecuted the church. He was known by Saul. And the Lord basically changed his name just so he didn't have to carry that same stigma with him everywhere he went. 
But look at Acts chapter 8, 1 to 4. Now Saul was consenting to his death, the death of Stephen there, at the end of chapter 7. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Yeah, no kidding. You go read places where Paul talked about what he did to Christians. They were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, devout men, carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Look at verse 4. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. What happened when Christians were persecuted in the first century? The church grew. I don't know about you, I don't mean to be Amos this morning, I don't mean to be a prophet of doom and gloom, but I tell you what, I see, I see in the future of our country a separation of the wheat from the chaff. I see it coming very soon. Who's going to be willing to sacrifice? Who's going to be willing to be persecuted? Again, that's just my opinion, but I think we need a separation of the wheat from the chaff. I think we have too many Jesus fans and not enough Jesus followers. So they endured that persecution. Back to chapter 1, verse 8, they were an evangelistic church. In Macedonia, in Achaia, Paul says, In every place your faith toward God has gone out so that, I, so that we do not need to say anything. Does that mean five minutes? Brother Lipscomb in his commentary writes, The loudest, clearest, most eloquent, and most unanswerable proclamation of the gospel is the unconscious testimony of Christian living. It may be sounded forth in great power in the midst of the severest afflictions, and often is. The troubles they endured for the name of Christ tested and revealed their faith, and so led to the fuller proclamation of the gospel. Paul says in verse 8, we do not need to say anything. We, we don't even need to instruct you in this, in this area. As far as being an imitator, as far as a, uh, a being a, uh, an evangelistic church, he says we don't even have to address that. We don't even have to say anything about it because they were already doing that. Verse 9, let me hit this just a minute. They forsook their idolatrous practices. But in order to do that, it required a dramatic change. You and I call that repentance. You and I call that repentance. There would be some people in, in, in the religious world, some people even in the Lord's church today, that would say you can become a Christian but you don't have to repent. You can continue committing fornication. You can continue in that adulterous relationship. You, you don't have to repent. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. I'm sorry. One example that comes to mind, what about the Christians in the city of Ephesus? In Acts chapter 19, you read in Acts 19 and verse 9, when they became Christians, they repented and they burned their magic books. That's repentance. That's repentance. And you read that idea uh, all, all through Scripture. Paul says there in 1 Thessalonians 1, they turn to God. All right, let's move on to chapter 3. we got just a couple minutes here. So Timothy goes to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let me just read, let's just begin in verse 1. Therefore, when we can no longer endure, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. And sent Timothy, our brother, a minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. Now, what's so great about this? Have you ever gone somewhere to visit somebody to establish them and encourage them, but you yourself go away 
even more established and more encouraged than when you went. Anybody ever been guilty of that? You ever go visit somebody in the hospital and you're like, I just don't know what to say. Maybe you visit a family after a tragic death. Somebody's been diagnosed with cancer. You go visit somebody in the nursing home and you just, you're just unsure, uncertain about how it's going to be and you come away and you're like, boy, that was great. If, if, if only I could have the same positive outlook on life that they did. If only I was willing to look at things from a different perspective in the same way that, that, that they do. And so you see this very same thing happen here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul wanted to come to them, you read in 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, about verses 17 and 18, but he was hindered by the Jewish leaders. Again, they, wherever Paul went, they kind of sniff him out and they run him out of town. All right, Certainly there are a, a few exceptions in the book of Acts. Paul tells them he did not want them to be shaken by their afflictions. In verse 3, how easy would it have been to continue on being a Christian as soon as you become a Christian? Folks, we're talking about three weeks in Acts 17. Three weeks after the church is established, persecution begins. Three weeks, literally. Paul says, I don't want you to give up. I don't want you to give in. So he heard back from Timothy good news concerning their spiritual condition. He heard more about their faith and love. He heard more about their, uh, you know, they, they, they remembered Paul, the relationship they had with him, the things that they had learned from him. Paul and his, comp and, uh, his companions were comforted by their faith. He was encouraged by their steadfastness. He was filled with joy. He kept them in his prayers night and day. And he had a deep desire to see them again and, and to allow them to continue to produce fruit. All right, I got a lot of references on there we didn't get to. I knew I wouldn't, but again, this is for you to take home and study. I, I think my time is up this morning. All right, there you go. I appreciate your comments. Thank you.
Good morning. We want to welcome everyone to our Lord's Day services. If you're inviting, if you're visiting with us and extend a special welcome, invite you back at every opportunity that you may have. At this time, we ask that both our members and visitors complete an attendance card and pass it toward the center aisle at this time. For those of you with small children and have need of it, we invite you to use the nurseries through the double doors in the back of the auditorium, infants to the right and toddlers to the left. Sick and sympathy, Connie Blackwell was admitted to the St. Francis Hospital on Friday and is currently on a ventilator. She has COVID and is having difficulty breathing. Jim Blackwell also has tested positive for COVID as well. Marvin Garner is in the local hospital with pneumonia and a blood clot. He is improving and is in no visitors please at this time, but he is negative for COVID. Please keep Gina Durden in your prayers to be restored as well as to recover from her current health condition at this time. Sam and Sherry's sister-in-law, Neva Hector, is scheduled for surgery Monday morning, and please keep her in your prayers as well. On the church and youth activities, please check the bulletin for meeting coming up in our, our area. Craig Simon will be our guest speaker today. He will be presenting the lessons this morning and this evening as well. We will not have the fifth Sunday singing this afternoon. Vernon Allen would like to meet with all the Bible class teachers in the fellowship room this evening following services. It will be a short meeting. The final Summer in the Sun series will be held Wednesday evening. Adam Fawn from the Central Congregation in Paducah, Kentucky will be our guest speaker for that. Bible class promotions will take place next Sunday, September the 5th. Students are asked to remain in their current classes until that time. The Thursday school program will begin again in September. The orientation is scheduled for su Sunday, September the 12th at 3 o'clock. The first day of classes will be held on the 16th from 9.30 and until noon. The children's home will not have their annual fish fry and home homecoming this September. The widow and widower class will begin Tuesday, September the 1st at 10 o'clock in the old fellowship room. All are invited. So if you know anyone who would benefit from this class, see uh, Jeff Williams for more information. Those taking the leadership in today's morning worship service. Scripture reading, Ben Kilgore. First prayer, John Garner. Second prayer, Clyde Jekis. And Howard Jones will have the song service. Three hundred twenty eight we're going to sing before the Lord's Supper is served. You gotta get out. Three hundred twenty eight.
we have once again come to that part of our worship where we observe the Lord's Supper. It is at this time that we remember our Lord and our Christ, our Savior. And just as the song said, he was wounded for us. He died for us. And again, he arose and overcame death. Let us remember our Lord and Savior as we take part of this memorial. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, creator of all, almighty, we come to you in prayer now, Father, and we thank you so much for this great opportunity that you've given us to gather around this table to take part in this memorial. It is at this time, Father, that we remember your son. We remember how he was spat upon, how he was mocked. And we remember how he was beaten beyond recognition, Father. We thank you so much for his broken body. It is at this time, Father, that as we take this bread, which represents his broken body, that we do so in a manner that is pleasing to you, Father. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty, Creator of all, we come to you in prayer now, Father, as we continue this memorial. We continue to commune with you, Father, and with one another. Again, at this time, we remember your Son and his great sacrifice for us. And we are so thankful, Father, for his precious blood, which washes away our sins, makes us white as snow. We pray now, Father, that as we take of this fruit of the vine, of this cup that represents your son's blood, that we do so in a manner that is pleasing to you, Father. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
before our offering, we're going to sing 663, 663. Separate and apart from the communion part of our worship is our giving, which is equally important for the work of the Lord's Church here locally and abroad. And we are, do this as we are commanded in Scripture to lay by and store. Please pray with me. Our loving Father, we're so thankful that we live in such a prosperous country, Father. We're, we're We have no idea what it is to be without, truthfully. We pray, Father, as we examine ourselves and the money that we gather here to further your work, that we do it with a, a gladful and pleasing heart, Father, that will take your word to the world and that much good will be done from it. We pray now as we do this that you will be with us and love us through our faults. In Christ's name, amen. going to sing 108, 108.
Sing 390 before our opening prayer. <clears throat> 390.
please stand for the prayer. Will you bow with me? Dear God, we come before you this morning. Thank you for this beautiful day we have. This opportunity for us to gather as a family uh, here to worship you and to lift each other up. Lord, we have many who we are thinking of this morning, many that were mentioned on our sick list, and we ask that you be with them, comfort them. If it's your will, will Lord, please bring them back where they can join us here at worship service. Lord, we think of all the turmoil and the chaos in the world this morning. We think about the people that are in Afghanistan and how their lives have been turned upside down here in the last week, Lord. We ask that you be with them, comfort them, and most of all, Lord, we ask that you prick their hearts so that they turn towards you. Lord, we know that we have brethren that are serving there. Lord, we imagine that they're, they're scared. There's a lot of unknown. Lord, we ask that you be with them. Give them strength. Lord, it's a humbling experience here, Lord, that we sit and think that we're allowed to gather here without that fear. Help us to use that opportunity in every way that we can in order to spread your gospel without the fear of death and persecution. Lord, we ask that you be with this church that gathers here. Help us to be a shining light in this community. Help us to bring glory to you. We ask that you be with our children, Lord, as they started their school years. We ask that you be with them and keep them safe, but also, Lord, that you help them to be an example to others around them. Help them to be kind and to show wisdom and forgiveness. and Help those of us who are raising these young children, help us to, to be good parents, to be good examples. Help us to raise them in a way that their faith grows strong, that they will grow in a way that brings them closer to you, that as they grow older, they will stay with your church, Lord, and they won't depart. Lord, we know we have so many blessings in this life, but the most important is that we get to call you Father. The fact that you would send your Son to die upon the cross for us. We know we fall short of honoring that sacrifice all the time. But Lord, we'd ask that you forgive us when we do, but help us to remember to strive every day. Help us to give us that strength. And we'll do the best we can to live up to that sacrifice, that Jesus dying upon the cross for us. Lord, we know there are some that have not decided to become a part of your church yet, Lord, or some that have fallen away. We ask today, Lord, that you prick their hearts. Help them to realize that we're not promised tomorrow, but we are promised eternal life with you if we obey your commandments. Lord, we ask that you be with all those here. Help us to be an example to those people and to each other. Help us to hold each other accountable and to lift each other up. It's through your son's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> 951 will be our song for encouragement following the lesson. Now we're going to sing 401. <clears throat> 401.
The scripture reading today will be from Psalms 40, verse 13 through 17. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let me be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion. Who seek to destroy my life, let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor. Who wish me evil, let them be confounded because they are ashamed. Who say to me, aha, aha. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such love your salvation say continually. The Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Good morning, everyone. We're very fortunate this morning. We have Craig Simons back with us to preach with us. He is here with his wife, Linda, daughter, Callie. You sure need to meet them. He's interested in being a minister here at the church. And if you missed class this morning, you missed an excellent lesson. He demonstrated a broad knowledge of the scripture, greatly prepared and put together well. So he's here from Houston, Mississippi. He has a father who lives in Illinois, and if you ever watch a Bible answer, he'll be on that next month. On it. Craig, come preach to us. The egg, that is, not the hen. Well, it depends. We'll get back to that in just a moment. The designation Christian is only found three times in God's Word. One occurrence is found in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, the first reference to the designation in Scripture, and they were called Christians first in Antioch. There's another occurrence in Acts chapter 26. You remember when Paul is uh, testifying before uh, Herod Agrippa. And Agrippa says to Paul in Acts 26 and verse 28, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. And that's where our song, we use invitation song often, almost persuaded. That's where that comes from. Almost, but not quite. The third designation of the name Christian is found in 1 Peter chapter 4 and in verse 16 where Paul's talking about if anybody suffers as a thief or as a murderer or, or, or if you've you know, done something that, that you need to be um, brought to justice because of. But he says, if any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. The label Christian began as an insult. It began as an insult. It was thrown upon the disciples of Christ by the Gentiles. It was not something that was positive when that name was first used. But later on it was adopted by the, Gen by the Christians, rather, by the disciples. That designation Christian was adopted by the disciples, and it became a badge of courage. This is who I am. I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. I'm, I'm not a hyphenated Christian. I'm not a Christian that calls myself after a denomination. I'm not a Christian that calls myself after a man. But I'm a Christian only. I want to be the same kind of Christian that they were in Acts chapter 2. I want to be the same kind of Christian that you read about in Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter 13, in Acts chapter 18. That's the kind of Christian that we want to be. James makes an uh, inference to this idea in James chapter 2 and in verse 7, do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Guess what that noble name is? Christian. Christian. 
When we're talking about being a Christian, we're talking about being a follower, a disciple of Jesus. You remember in Matthew chapter 28 in the Great Commission, Jesus offers this thought, Go and make disciples of all the nations. A disciple is a learner, a follower, a pupil, one who takes something from their master teacher. Easton's Bible Dictionary has probably the the best definition of a disciple. It reads like this. A disciple of Christ, they have four things, is one who believes in his doctrine, number one. Number two, rests on his sacrifice. Number three, imbibes his spirit. And number four, imitates his example. A disciple is one who believes his doctrine, rests on his sacrifice, imbibes his spirit and imitates his example. When you and I call ourselves Christians, that word Christian implies ownership. I am not my own. You are not your own, Paul would say to the church at Corinth. You were bought with a price. You are not your own. If you are a Christian, if you are a disciple of Christ, if you are a child of God, you are not your own. But you are Christ. You belong to Him. We call ourselves the church of Christ, the church belonging to Christ. The church that you read about in the Bible. Can we be that? Can we be that if we we did what they did, if we obey what, what they obeyed, if we follow the same doctrine that they followed? Can we be the church that you read about in the Bible? Can we be the church belonging to Christ? Can we be individuals? Can we be people belonging to Christ? I'll contend with you this morning that we can. If you will open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus offers what's often been described as the great invitation. Jesus offers many invitations all throughout Scripture, but this one is called the great invitation because all people are invited. Matthew uh, Matthew 11, beginning in verse 28, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We call ourselves Christians, we call ourselves disciples of Christ, and and we ought to believe his doctrine and we ought to imbibe his spirit. You read about that idea in Philippians chapter 2 and in verse 5 where Paul would say, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Peter would offer this thought in 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 21. Specifically talking about the idea of suffering. But saying that he has, Jesus has left us an example that we should follow in his steps. We're disciples. We're followers of Christ. We're Christians only and only Christians, as it's often been said. There's a story of a young man who moved to a big city, took a job with a Fortune 500 company. And shortly into his tenure there, the company was having a formal event on Thursday evening. And it was about Wednesday afternoon and he had completely forgot that he needed a tux 
to wear to this formal event. And so he went home and he checked his closet and he looked at his tux and his tux, his tux Cedo was in a mess and he brings it to his normal dry cleaners and he sets it on the counter and they look at him and they say, we, we can't handle this. We can't have it ready for you in such a short time. And so he remembered across town, he had seen a place and on the, on the front of the establishment it said one hour cleaners. And he said, that's exactly what I need. And so he grabs his tux and he gets in his car, he drives across town and he comes in and he lays it on the counter and they, it's a oh boy, it's wrinkled and it's wadded up. It's just a mess. And the person looked at him and they said, we, we, can't, we can't handle this. We can't do this. He said, I need it by tomorrow. They said, we can't do that. He said, but the name on the, 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 the writing on the establishment out here, it says one hour cleaners. And they said, that's just our name. We can't do that. Sometimes we want all of the benefits and privileges that go with the name Christian, but we don't want any of the responsibilities that come with it. A verse that speaks loudly to me when I think about that idea is what Paul says, if you will follow along with me in Philippians chapter 3 and in verse 10, and there, there may be a spot in this verse where we, where we pump the brakes and we come to a screeching halt. Because there are a few phrases in this verse that sound really good to us. Paul says, listen to this, that I may know him. Oh, yes. When we talk about knowing Jesus, we're talking about having a relationship with him. That I may know him. Let me ask you this question this morning. Do you want a relationship with Jesus, yes or no? Let me ask you this question this morning. Do you want a personal relationship with Jesus, yes or no? Sometimes that phrase, I understand, it's been abused, it's been misused in our religious world today, but the answer is yes. You want a relationship with Jesus. You do. So Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And we read those first two phrases and you know what? Hey, hey that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I'm going to have a relationship with him. I'm, I'm going to be a part of the final resurrection. I'm going to be one of the called, one of the invited in that you read about in Matthew 25 and in verse 34. Inherit that kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world, we read half of that verse and we say, whew, that sounds good. I, I want to be a part of that. I want the name and I want the privileges and I want the benefits and I want the honor. But we keep reading verse 10 and Paul, the next phrase here, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, hang, hang on, Paul, hang on just a second. I can deal with Number one, phrase number one, I may know him. I can deal with that. I can deal with phrase number two. That, that Yeah, I, I want to be involved in the final resurrection and be a child of God for all eternity and, and experience that power on the great day. I can, I can do that. Sign me up for that list. But Paul, when you said fellowship... Fellowship with his sufferings, you lost me there. I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not so sure about that. And then you get to phrase number four in verse 10, being conformed to his death. Now, well, hang on, hang on. See, I've read, I've read the Gospels. Paul, you're not going to get me here. I've read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, Paul. I know how Jesus died. I know that he was betrayed. I know that he was mocked. I know that he was sped upon. I know that he was scourged. I know that he was beaten. I know that they twisted a crown of thorns and placed it on his head. I know his hands and feet were nailed to the cross. So you, hey, give me one and two, but I'm going to have to pass on three and four. But see, that's not the way it works.
If you're a disciple of Christ, you're his disciple for thick or for thin. If you're a disciple of Christ, you're his disciple for rich or for poor. How many times in the Gospels do you read about people wanting to be a Jesus follower? Lord, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do in order to be your follower? What do I need to do in order to have a relationship with God? And Jesus tells them this one thing you lack. Go and sell all your goods and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Um, I'm not so sure about that. I'm, I'm not sure that I like that idea. Lord, I want to be a Jesus follower. I want to follow you. I want to have a relationship with God. I, 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 want to be, I want to be in it to win it. And Jesus would say, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Well, you know what? I am pretty comfortable in my lifestyle right now. Uh, maybe when I get uh, a little bit older, or maybe, maybe, you know, maybe we can, maybe we can just uh, let's just smooth over the rough edges a little bit. Let's change, let's change the conditions just a little bit. The question's asked to you this morning: What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Don't you love the theme of discipleship in Scripture? One of my favorite themes in all of the Bible is the theme that you find in the Gospels of discipleship. In your songbooks, the song number is 926. Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall, friendless, forsaken, betrayed by all. Hearken what meaneth the sudden call. What will you do with Jesus? Jesus is standing on trial still. You can be false to him if you will. You can be faithful through good or ill. What will you do with Jesus? Will you evade him as Pilate tried? Or will you choose him whatever be tied? Vainly you struggle from, from him to hide. What will you do with Jesus? And then verse 4 of that song. Jesus, I give thee my heart today. Jesus, I'll follow thee all the way. Gladly obeying thee will you say this will I do. With Jesus. The chorus goes like this What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Friend, we all have to answer that question. What will you do with Jesus? The greatest questions that were ever asked in the book of Acts, pertain to that very question. What must I do? What do I need to do in order to have a right relationship with God? In order to take upon myself the identifying marks of being a disciple, being a follower, being a learner, being a pupil, of Christ being a Christian. The song goes on to say neutral you cannot be. You can't be neutral. You can't ride the fence. You can't straddle the line. You've got to be all in or you've got to fold. Could it be that some of the hardships that we see in the Lord's church today is because people were never really disciples to begin with? 
Maybe your children never had their own faith. They never had their own relationship with Jesus. But they wanted to ride the coattails of mom and dad's faith until Christianity became too convenient, too inconvenient, until morality required them to sacrifice something in their own life in order to be a Jesus follower. The song goes on to say, Someday your heart will be asking, O oh friend, what will he do with me? Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I think specifically there he's talking about those who lived under the Mosaic law, under the Old Testament law. 613 commandments, thou shalt, thou shalt not. 613 in the Old Testament, not, not including, not in, uh, in addition to the Babylonian Talmud, which is basically 20 volumes encyclopedia size that were added to the Mosaic law. Matthew would speak to the religious leaders, or Jesus would speak to the religious leaders in Matthew 23 and verse 4, speaking about the Pharisees. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Peter in Acts chapter 15 and in verse 10, in talking about the Jews coming to Christ, said to the Jews, the question was about circumcision there. Now therefore, why do you test God? By putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 would encourage Christians who are wanting to dip back into the law of Moses. See, that was a problem in the first century church when persecution arose. Some of them, some of them wanted to dip back into the law of Moses. Well, you know what? I'm still worshiping the same God. That was their reasoning. And Paul said, stand fast, therefore, and the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. A religion of vain traditions, a religion of men, a religion of 20 volumes encyclopedia size that were added to the first five books, the Torah. Things like this. If a hen lays an egg on the Sabbath, is it okay to eat it? Well, that depends. The majority of the Pharisees, their opinion was that if the hen was an egg-laying hen, it was not okay to eat the egg on the Sabbath because the hen was working. But if the hen was not an egg-laying hen, if it was just a hen being fattened up to be eaten and she happened to, lay an egg, happened to lay an egg, then it was okay to eat the egg because it was not her primary work. But then afterward, you'd have to cook the hen because she worked on the Sabbath. Things like this. Is it okay to look at yourself in a mirror? On the Sabbath. What do you think? Should you look at yourself in the mirror. On a Sabbath. The Jews said no. Because if you see a gray hair. You might be tempted to pluck it. And this would be reaping. And as such a violation. Of the Sabbath. What about if your house catches on fire. If your house catches on fire, is it okay to get a bucket of water and start putting your fire out? On the Sabbath, this is what we're talking about, on the Sabbath. The answer is no, you can't do that. Well, how many pairs of clothes can I get out of my burning house if my house is on fire? Well, if you have time to put on one pair of clothes, you can grab an extra set of clothes. And then you can run out of your burning house. Well, what if there's a Gentile that's outside and he's getting buckets of water and he's dumping water 
on my house that's on fire. Well, you can let him do it if he's a Gentile. If he's already doing it, you can let him do it, but you can't ask him to do it. Things like that. 20, 20 volumes worth. In the woe chapter in Matthew chapter 23, you remember when Jesus offers the woe to the scribes and Pharisees. He says, you tithe of mints and of anise and of cumin. And so the Pharisees would break off a branch of one of their spices, whether it be sage or whether it be mint or whatever it is, and they would... They would Break off little leaves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's God's pile. That's my pile. And they would do that with each of their spices. And Jesus says you're meticulous about all of these little silly insignificant things but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. When you look at the text in Matthew chapter 2011 or Matthew chapter 11 uh, beginning in verse 28 Jesus offers the great invitation to all who are burdened to all who are heavy laden. When you look at the surrounding context, you may ask the question, what are some things that Jesus offers in the text? What does he offer us? You go back to verse 25 of Matthew chapter 11. He offers an understanding to those who are seeking truth. He would say in our text this morning in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So there's a learning, there's an understanding, there's a discernment, there's an ability to know things there. Verse 26, he would offer a relationship with his father. Verse 28, he would offer rest from the guilt and the burden of sin. Verse 29, he would offer sympathetic care and understanding same verse, verse 29, he offers not only a relationship with a father, but also a relationship with him. Verse 30, he offers eternal rest for the soul. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's an alternative to the taxing burden of the Mosaic law. It's also an alternative to the taxing burden of carnal existence. A lifestyle of sin a lifestyle of purposelessness, a lifestyle of meaninglessness. Jesus offers an alternative. So the question is, what will you do with Jesus? The yoke that Jesus describes in Matthew chapter 11 in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. The yoke can be painful and grueling as indicated in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and in verse 48. Therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and need of everything and he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Why? Because they rebelled against God's way. Which was far simpler than the alternative. The alternative was... That in 722, the northern kingdom of ten tribes would be overrun by Assyria. 
The alternative was in 606 B.C. that the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin would be taken into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And God tells them in Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you turn your back on me, this is what will happen. There's a lesson there for us. Do we want to be enslaved? Do we want to be in captivity to our own lust, our own desires, our own sin? Or do we want to turn everything over to the Lord? Do we want to submit to Him and humbly follow Him? Humbly seek after His path? Because the other side of that yoke is what the Apostle John describes in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God. It's, it's, it's easy and it's pleasant. Jesus would say, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John would say that we keep His commandments. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. God has never asked you to do anything that you cannot do. God has never asked you to follow where you cannot go. God has never asked you to sacrifice what you do not have. What will you do with Jesus, my friend? Neutral you cannot be. Brother Adam Fawn this next Wednesday is going to be studying the text a little bit later in Revelation chapter 3. There's an invitation in this chapter in verse 20 for Christians to repent. Come back to God in order to repent. I've got to abandon my sinful lifestyle. I've got to be willing to lay that down at Jesus' feet and pick up. A yoke that is easy and light. One that promises freedom. And one that promises blessing. And one that promises eternal life. Jesus would say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Today, the Lord's church has been given the blessing of offering the great invitation. In Revelation 22 and verse 17, the Spirit and the bride, the Spirit speaks to us through the Word. So I can be convicted, I can be instructed, I can be corrected through the Word, I can be trained, I can learn and know and understand what I need to do in order to be in a right relationship with God. I can know that. The Spirit and the bride say, come. The bride is the church. Church, that's our, that's our mission. That is our charge. Take the gospel into the whole world. That same text, the Lord would say, Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. It's available today. You can have a relationship with Jesus today. And if you do, there's a heavenly invitation awaiting you. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Do you know my Jesus? Do you know him? If not, you can know him today. 
You can have a relationship with him. You can become a Christian. You can obey the gospel in the same way they did in Acts chapter 2. The same way they did in Acts chapter 8. The same way they did in, in Acts chapter 18. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we reenact that by submitting to baptism. Colossians 2.12 calls baptism a work of God. It's not a work of man. We do it because God commands it. We do it, 1 Peter chapter 3.21, because it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. Will you do that this morning, confessing Him as a Son of God, as Lord and Savior of your life? If you need to get back with Him, if you want to walk in step with Him today, if you want to open the door and invite Jesus into your life, please do that this morning while we stand and while we sing. Further announcements, we're going to sing for a closing song, the doxology, number 66. Then Brother Clyde will come and dismiss us. <clears throat> Let us pray together, please. Our dear God and our Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you at this time, thanking you for the blessing of another opportunity to gather together, to assemble together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and to worship you, remembering Jesus' sacrifice that he made through our service of the communion service offer up prayers to you and sing these songs of praises to you and hear another lesson from your holy word. 
Father, we thank you so much for the hope of heaven. Without Jesus and without his sacrifice, without the shedding of his blood for our sins, we would not have that hope. And we thank you for the hope that you've given us. Father, we pray that you'll be with each and every one of us as we leave here today, that we'll take the things that have been said to our hearts and apply them to our lives. Father, we also want to remember those who have been mentioned earlier who are dealing with physical illnesses. Pray that the things being done to them may restore them to their health. But Father, most of all, we want to remember those who are spiritually ill, that we can reach out to them, let them know that we love them, that we care for them, and try to encourage them to come back home where they need to be, that they'll be welcomed with open arms by God and by the brethren. Father, we ask at this time that you forgive us of anything that may be wrong in our lives, that we may have that hope. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.